Good morning. So today is a massive day if you're a big fan of Spark. Wherever you happen to be using it, this is going to mean something to you. So Spark 3.0 has just been released. It is now fully live, out there in the wild. Certainly if you're using Databricks, the Databricks Runtime 7.0 is now a real thing. It's no longer in beta. So you can go and give it a try and it's got a ton of really cool features. So we're going to have a look at why they're really cool, what it means to you, and if you like the video, don't forget to like and subscribe. All right, let's have a look. So first things first, there's a big old announcement blog. It's written by all of the usual, so you've got Matei Saharia, Ren Zen, all the big head honchos of the tech world in Databricks have put out this huge big blog that goes into masses and masses of detail about all the new features. So I thought I'd just pull out the key ones and just try and explain, this is why it's a big deal. This is why I am ridiculously excited right now. So, Key headlines, we're talking dynamic partition pruning. Now that sounds so boring. I mean, I love partitioning, but it sounds so, so dull, except it enables some of the biggest things. If you're used to trying to do things in a star scheme -y kind of way, you like facts and dimensions and lots of joins, this is gonna change your life. So we'll have a look at dynamic partition pruning. Adaptive query execution, really, really cool. Essentially, your queries are gonna go a lot faster. It's kind of nice. And then lots of other improvements around pandas, around kind of improved Python handling, we've got types in Python now. Structured streaming is a whole new UI. R, the UDFs in R have been pretty terrible for quite a while. There's new interrupts with sending data for the vectorized uh, UDFs are a lot better, so that's gonna go a lot faster. And there's just a ton of fixes in there. I think the blog says over 3,400 Jira tickets have been fixed in this release. So it is huge in terms of what it does. But the top two I'm going to focus on. So dynamic partition pruning, why you should care about dynamic partition pruning. Let's have a bit of a look. So partitioning and Spark is, it's kind of a big deal. So it's not like a SQL query engine. We don't have an index. We don't have a B tree. We don't have a way to efficiently say, my data's held at these particular pages on the disk. Instead, we have to say, my data is partitioned into folders and only read the data in that folder. So if I don't have partitioning, I've got a query like this, I've got some sales with some months. It's got no organization in there, so I say month is three. I have to read all of my data onto my executor. So I read the entire table, bring it in. Each executor then filters down in memory, and then I eventually get my results. And oftentimes that's the way we have to work because we don't have partitioning or we're querying on something that isn't the partitioning key. But if we can avoid it, then that's great. So what we want is this kind of thing. I've got my Hive partition folders, month equals one, month equals two, etc. So when my query comes in and I'm querying based on that same folder name, then it can go, oh, actually, I don't need to read all of the data. I don't need to read the files in months one, two, and four. I just get the files that I need. Suddenly, my entire query is so much faster. I can just actually get all of my workers and say, hey, just read the different chunks of data in this one folder rather than bringing everything in and then chucking away most of it. So huge, but then partitioning is normal. What is this dynamic partition pruning? So the classic thing, if I'm trying to do some star scheme things, if I'm going, I am all in on the lakes and I don't want some relational warehousey type thing when I've built a traditional SQL structure, and so I've got something like this, I've got a real big, deep partitioned fact table, and then I've got some other smaller dimension tables, and I want to filter those dimension tables. Now, traditionally, if I'm joining those together, and I put a filter query on my dimension, that won't pass it across. It's still gonna read the entirety of my fact table and then filter it in memory. So it has no concept of this cross filtering between dimensions to hit partition pruning, or at least it didn't. So the big thing that we're now getting is that when we're talking dynamic partition pruning, it can actually work out, oh, hey, I'm filtering the table that I'm joining on. Why don't we pass that across and use that as a partition pruning predicate? So essentially, the only thing is the execution plan has just got a lot fancier. So now it's going to read things properly, work out where it can get partition elimination and cross apply them. Now, if you're building something like a Kimball style warehouse, you're doing lots of facts, lots of dimensions, and you're trying to do that in the lake, then it just means magically your queries will go faster. Whereas for a while, we've been having to build star schemas, but try and trick the user into going, you don't want to filter on the date dimension, let's make a view that actually combines them and expose the facts date dimension as that, and then reproduce logic and 
basically we're having to kind of do a load of hoops and jumps to trick people into hitting partition columns. Now we don't have to. And now we need to dig into it and see like, just how nicely can you do it. If I filter on a random column, a joining column, I don't know how detailed it goes. We'll be digging into that soon. But it's a real, real good step and a real kind of good show that doing things like star schemas, doing things like traditional data structures inside a lake is not impossible and is actually really, really performant. So that is huge to me. If you don't want to go and build things into a relational warehouse, build it in a lake and it'll still perform. It's a massive message. Okay, so that's why partition pruning is huge, really good. You don't have to do much, it's just going to start doing it. Um, but yeah, real good reason right there to start using the, the newest runtime of Databricks, which is really, really cool. Next one that we've got is this uh, adaptive query execution. So if I'm running a query, if I just write a load of Spark transforms, hit an action, it goes off, spins up a Spark job, there's a planning stage. So a bit of yellow, a bit of, what am I going to do? It'll make a query plan. So I'll say, based on all the things I've seen, this is how I'm going to execute it. And because it's quite a complex one, there's several times I've got to shuffle the data. And anytime I'm shuffling, I'm putting the data down onto disk, chopping it up in a different way and pulling it back up. So they're kind of like materialized steps in my execution plan. So in this case, I've got four stages. So there's four breakpoints when I'm putting the data down, picking it back up again and doing something else. Now, traditionally, once it's made that plan, that's it. It's got to follow it through. And it's all based on estimation. So if I go, oh, that looks about 100 rows, that looks about 100 million rows, I'll make a plan based on that. Then even if that doesn't happen to be true, I just carry out my plan regardless. That's normal um, query execution. Now, the adaptive query execution, essentially, at each one of these stages, just takes a step and go, wait, OK, let's see what actually happened and reevaluate our plan and make a better plan as we go. Maybe run some optimizations, maybe add some more steps that'll make the later steps better with the information that we now know. So essentially, each of these stages, it's stopping and going, can I make a better plan? Can I make a better plan? So it's essentially just improvements to the query engine that just suddenly gonna speed up a whole load of stuff. And it does it by doing a few different things, about looking for certain types of joins and changing how it could attack them, maybe doing a broadcast when it wasn't going to before. It does um, some partition coalescing. Uh, I stole a picture about that in a moment. Uh, but yeah, there's loads of really, really good stuff that's just gonna speed up your queries. So partition coalescing, for example, this is where the one from the actual release block. If I've got two lots of kind of uh, bits of data, I'm gonna they are resulting in a load of partitions. So I've done some transforms, I've taken some data sets and I've kind of tried to do kind of a join, I need to join them together, or I'm doing an aggregate, and that's spat out a load of shuffle partitions onto my disk. And so my next stage, I'll be doing five different aggregation tasks to work out the results so I can then proceed with my query. Now, what the saying is, well, actually, three of those are fairly small. We didn't realize they'd be that small when we made this plan. As soon as we actually then turn on uh, adaptive query execution, it goes, oh, that's going to result in three small ones. Let's just coalesce them into a bigger one, and that's going to be more efficient. I'm now doing three reasonably sized aggregation tasks rather than two big ones and three tiny ones. And that kind of skew, that difference in terms of how long each task takes, makes optimization, makes performance. It, basically, it's going to go faster. So again, this kind of thing, it's currently a config you should turn on. I imagine it's just going to be on by default very soon but really, really cool stuff that's just gonna make things go faster. And that's one of the key messages, I guess, in the whole of Spark 3.0. It's, it's just faster because of this kind of stuff. Um, so a lot of people, as they switch the runtime, you know, they just turn it on and go, okay, I'm gonna upgrade to the latest one. We'll just see things go faster, which is really, really cool, really, really good to see. Um, with the rest of them, I'm not gonna go through them now. I'll talk a little bit about them, um, but plenty of time for more videos and we can go through some more stuff in more detail in the future. So Pandas and Python improvements has some interesting ones. So a lot of it is improvements to Koalas. That's the Spark friendly version of uh, Pandas. Just to improve code coverage, to improve compatibility. Uh, it's improving the UDFs. So if you've built a um, user-defined function, then traditionally they were terrible and they were sending row by row outside of the Java virtual machine. Just all of the performance pain. 
Um, and they've made it a bit better with things like vectorization, all that kind of stuff. And there's some more improvements to make those even faster. So we're using a pandas style at UDF, there's a load of things in there. We've got Python types, which feels weird. So if you're trying to do something in Python, you're like, oh God, it'd be much easier if I could just tell Python it's expecting a string rather than just any old variable. If you're trying to build out a fairly formal application, you want to do testing and assertions and all of that stuff, you can kind of just now do these Python type hints and go, it's meant to be a string, just to kind of build out expectations in the way it's working, which is, again, really, really cool. More and more stuff we can get in there to actually formalize some of these big Python applications that have been sprawling and growing, and then people are going, maybe I should have been using Scala. Um, but yeah, loads of really cool stuff in there. Structured streaming, fancy new UI, so if you're monitoring streaming going through, you can see a little bit more about the roads input, the road process, the throughput, gives you this massive breakdown of this is everything that's going on under the hood in the stream that I'm working with. Just general usability, making it much, much easier to see what's going on under the hood. Uh, our UDFs, again, that is more to do with adding vectorization. In. So similar to the Pandas one where R oh, used to be terrible because we're sending row by row by row by row by row outside of the Java virtual machine into the R uh, interrupt. Now we've got Apache Arrow built in. Now Apache Arrow is kind of like, it's like Parquet but for in memory. So it's kind of a, it's a inter interchange format so we can take the data we're trying to get out into the R service outside of the JVM, squeezing it down into column store, making it really, really, really efficient bugging that into memory and pushing it out. So rather than doing lots of row by row, making it very, very chatty, we're sending efficient chunks of data in and out to the Java virtual machine, which is still gonna be slower than doing it inside Spark, but it's just a hell of a lot more efficient. It's less of a big no-no doing that kind of thing because we've got this stuff in there. And finally, all of the Jira. So again, as we said at the start, there's just a ton of quality of life changes, of bug fixes, of improving error handling, just loads and loads and loads and loads of things going in there to make your life easier. So that's it for the roundup. There's a whole load of stuff in there. Again, go and read the blogs, go and read the detail. If you haven't already, sign up next week because the Spark and AI Summit next week is being held over in San Fran, but it's entirely remote. It's entirely free. So you can just sign up and there's just a ton of deep dive sessions and there's loads of things, oddly enough, about Spark 3.0 being in there. So you can get in, give it a go, and dive into the depths of it. Now, it'd be interesting if you're not on the Databricks side and you're looking at the sign-up side, I don't know how quickly we're going to see Spark 3.0 appear in the new Azure sign-ups analytics. That's going to be interesting, and we'll keep an eye out on for that. But for those of us on the Databricks side, it's out there, it's ready, you can start using it in anger, you can use it in production, because it is a real live thing. So that is all kinds of awesome. All right, so we'll be doing more Spark videos soon, very much more kind of digging into Spark 3.0 and having a look at some of these examples. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and we'll have some more videos popping on the side about some of the stuff we've looked at. All right, you guys, have a great time.